which are co-organized by um, China Association for Science and Technology, uh, Future Earth Global Secretariat Hub China, Chinese Academy of Agriculture Sciences. Uh, today we have uh, an opening speech and uh, eight presentation, and then we have five minutes for question and answers. So let's begin. Dear distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and friends, welcome to the COP27 event on climate change and sustainable development in the post COVID 19 area. I am excited to meet you all and thank you for your active participation. COP27 seeks renewed solidarity between the countries the deliver on the landmarks of the Paris Agreement for superior development of people and the planet. This is in particular of more importance in the present post-COVID-19 era. Although COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted our normal way of life, it has not diminished the importance and urgency to address the issues of climate change and the sustainable development. We are still confronting a growing energy crisis and a continuous increase of greenhouse gas concentrations are touching the record break limits. Human caused climate change policies in the street to the humanity by increasing the risk of the extreme weather events. In the post pandemic area, it is even more important the ever to balance the need of climate revival while promoting for long carbon, low carbon and climate sustainability world. Taking these challenges requires the all round wisdom and the integrated actions to combat climate change from all the countries. In light of these new emergency challenges, we talk this opportunity of COP27 conference we are now getting here for the climate change and sustainable development in the post COVID 19 area side event. We hope that this side event can offer us a great platform for international conversation and discussion to share our new thoughts on climate change and sustainable development for all sectors. This side event is jointly supported by China Association for Science and Technology, China National Committee for Future Earth, Future Earth Global Secretary, Harbour China, and the China Academy of Agricultural Sciences. Let me express our sincere appreciation for their constant support and assistance. The site event invites scientists from diverse fields, and they will deliver talks on climate change, ecosystem, carbon neutrality and sustainable development. I would like to express my sincere thanks for presenting your research work here today. With that, I would like to hand over the stage back to our chair, Dr. Yin Chen. Thank you, Dr. Chen, for hosting the meeting. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, and I hope all of you enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon and good evening. I'm Wong Jiedong from Sun Yat-sen University. The topic of this presentation is a picture of climate change in the South China Sea and the Great Bay Area for the next century. The South China Sea is the largest scenic closed modular sea in the world, which plays an important role in the world's climate. It transmits the Enso and the Indian Ocean dipole cyclones, which are changing in the internal 
energy transport. Located on the south coast of China, the Guangdong, Hong Kong, and Macau Great Bay area is well known as the fastest development area in the world. The rapid growth of climate population urbanization in this region are very sensitive and vulnerable to the climate change. Accordingly, we focused on the following questions. What will happen to climate change in the South China Sea, like the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Great Bay Area? Due to the close resolution and unreleased topograph, the global Earth system models are not able to address the detailed picture of climate change of the South China Sea and the Great Bay Area in the future. Instead, the high resolution climate change projections can be well realized by dynamic downscaling where the Sun Yasan University Community Integrated Models, CC. The system is an unstructured super high resolution model that is developed by Sun Yasan University and uh, its partners with an uh, average resolution of kilometers, even meters for some spatial area. Based on the supercomputer of Tianhe 2, the system has realized the recursive operational prediction of the global and regional marine environment. This model achieves variable super high resolution around the Hong Kong, Guangdong, Macau, Great Bay Area, and ranks the highest resolution model of the Great Bay Area in the world with a higher horizontal resolution of two meters. It can be seen that the system will simulate the 339 bridge piers along the Hong Kong, Fuhai, and Macau Bridge. Okay. The following data used to drive system are from the 11 SIM6 or system model simulation under the SSP 5 to 5 scenario and integrated over the period from 2020 to 2100. Not that the tiders are included along the open boundaries in order to provide tidal mixing effects. First, the future climate change projected by the CSIM model clearly shows that the South China Sea surface temperature will constantly increase with a long-term warming trend. The average sea surface temperature in this region will rise about 3.7 degree by the end of the 21st century under the SSP 585 scenario. This implies the record broken warming climate and weather in the future will be more frequently happened with a serious social economic consequences. Second, the system evaluated the impact of climate change induced sea level rise on the future coastal inundation over the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Great Bay Area, with a resolution of about meters less to grid. The three time periods of 2020, 2050, and 2100 are simulated, and the results show from 2020, the flooding area of the Great Bay Area will increase 25% by 2050 and 39% by 2100. This implies that with the sustained sea level rise, especially for those low land regions around the Great Bay Area, will be more sensitively vulnerable to the warming climate. Finally, we use a video showing the detailed climate change in the South China Sea and the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Great Bay Area of the next century. Climate change in the South China Sea and the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area 
GHMGBA are the key issues concerned by scientists and policymakers. Due to the coarse resolution and unrealistic topography of global climate models, GCMs, the sixth phase of coupled model comparison project data of IPCC are not adequate to be used to address the future climate change of the South China Sea and the Greater Bay Area. The high resolution regional climate model Sun Yat-sen University Community Integrated Model system with an average resolution of kilometers was forced by 11 different six GCM simulations under the SSP 585 scenario and integrated over the period from 2020 to 2100. Using flexibility of the unstructured grid, the system is able to simulate the considerable detailed variations of the sea surface temperature and currents in the South China Sea and the coastal flooding around the GHMGBA. The South China Sea is located in the tropical monsoon region. The surface current system of the SCS is mainly driven by monsoon winds, which significantly interacted with local topography, tides, and ambient sea water intrusion. The variation of the monthly average sea surface temperature is following seasonal cycles with a great interannual variability. Warm water body shift its position from south to north centering on the tropics synchronizes with solar altitude changing. The future climate change projected by the system model clearly show that the South China sea surface temperature will keep increase with a long-term warming trend. The average sea surface temperature in this region will rise about 3.6 degrees Celsius by the end of the 21st century, the SSP 585 scenario. This implies the record broken warming climate and weather in the future will be more frequently happen with serious social economy consequences. With a resolution about meters nested grid, system evaluated the impact of climate change induced sea level rise on the future coastal inundations over the Guangdong Hong Kong Macau Greater Bay Area. The three time sections of 2020, 2050, and 2100 are simulated and the results show from 2020, the flooding area of the Great Bay Area will increase 25% by 2050 and 39% by 2100. This implies that with sustained sea level rise, especially for those low land regions around the GHMGBA will be more severely vulnerable to warming climate. That's all. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Chen Ying from Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Let me share my screen. Uh, my presentation will focus on China's green and low carbon development transition in post COVID-19 era. And uh, I would like to say a few words about the impacts of COVID-19 and talk to, uh, about China's efforts uh, to promote green and low carbon development transition. As we know, this year is the third year of COVID-19 pandemic and the pandemic has caused numerous impacts on uh, world economy and the, the daily life of everyone. Regarding the climate change, global carbon emissions jumped by 5.4% in 2020, but afterwards it uh, rebounded again to higher level. Uh, according to a projection of WMO, uh, um, there is a 50% chance that the annual global temperature will temporarily reach 1.5 degree uh, for at least the one of the next five years. And the scientist has warned uh, that exceeding 1.5 degree could trigger multiple climate uh, tipping points. In China, the summer of this year is the hottest uh, since the 1961, 
and the precipitation is the second lowest uh, uh, since then. And the, uh, since Um, uh, according to IPCC Air 6 Working Group 2, uh, the climate change impact and the risk are becoming increasingly complex and more difficult to manage. I'm a lead author of IPCC Air 5 and the Air 6 uh, Working Group 3. Uh, the con one of the important conclusion from the latest uh, report uh, is we are not on track. Limiting warming to 1.5 degree require uh, the net zero carbon emissions around 2050 and uh, uh, for, for two degree target. Uh, net zero around the 2070s. Uh, UNEP has just uh, launched a, a new report on emission gap uh, in 2030. Uh, there are still large gap uh, for 1.5 degree, 20 to 23 uh, gigawatt gigatons of CO2 equivalent. For two degree target, the gap is uh, 12 to uh, 15 uh, gigaton uh, CO2 equivalent. Uh, the window is closing and the climate crisis calls for rapid transformation of uh, societies. Uh, in September 2020, President Xi Jinping announced uh, China's carbon peaking and carbon neutrality targets. Uh, in the past uh, uh, two years, China has made great efforts to build one plus N policy system. Uh, what is one plus N policy system? One stands for a working guideline, uh, which include uh, five uh, principles and uh, the key targets in the, in the next uh, uh, 40 years, and a lot of key uh, areas and the priority targets has been identified. Uh, uh, another important uh, document is action plan for carbon dioxide peaking before 2030, uh, it, which includes the uh, uh, 10 action plans covering uh, energy, uh, transportation, uh, buildings, uh, and so on, uh, different uh, sectors. Uh, and uh, in key uh, areas and the sectors, there are over uh, 30 uh, documents and uh, uh, supportive uh, measures. Uh, each uh, province uh, has made their own uh, action plan uh, for carbon picking. Uh, among the uh, policies and the measures, I think uh, double control for energy consumption and energy intensity uh, is one of the key uh, 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 policy instruments. Uh, recently, it has been updated uh, to exclude the uh, energy use uh, for materials and uh, it will be uh, 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 transformed from energy uh, control to carbon control uh, in the near future. Uh, in the past 10 years, uh, China has made great uh, progress. The carbon emissions per unit of GDP decreased uh, a lot and the share of core uh, in energy mix uh, 
decreased from seventy uh, percent to fifty six percent within uh, ten years. Uh, the renewable energy uh, development uh, very fast. Uh, up to now, the renewable energy capacity uh, has been over 1,000 gigawatts. I spent two weeks uh, in Qinghai province last year to visit uh, um, uh, uh, many places. And uh, I've seen uh, the the largest uh, uh, PV uh, uh, generation uh, plant, and uh, the solar thermal power generation plant. And I I took these pictures myself. Um, for carbon sinks, up to now the coverage forestry coverage reached. Uh, uh, twenty four percent and the uh, forestry stock uh, is over uh, seventeen point five billion uh, cubic meters. Uh, China also have some uh, gen uh, demonstration uh, project on CCUS. Uh, Beijing hosts the, the Olympic game uh, early this year. Uh, it's a it's a also a good opportunity to raise the public awareness on carbon neutrality. Uh, this slide comes from my chapter in IPCC Air 6 Working Group 3. It shows uh, different country at uh, uh, different stage of development uh, have to find their own uh, development pathway to reach the sustainable development goals and the international uh, cooperation is very uh, important uh, in other words our climate is our future and our future is in our hands that's the hello everybody I'm Zhou Tianjin from IAP, Chinese Academy of Sciences. Today, I will talk about climate change and extreme events. We know this year, around many parts of the world, we have seen climate extremes. For example, in China, we have seen the strongest heat wave since 1961. China has issued the highest heat alert for more than 70 cities. And over eastern part of China, there is a serious drought. In UK, Britain recorded its hottest ever on July 19th. The higher temperature is above 40 degrees Celsius in the eastern part of England. We still remember last year, there was a record-breaking heat extreme in North America. Many occurred on June 30th. The outdoor surface air temperature is above 46 degrees Celsius. In addition to temperature extremes, we also see extreme rainfall. For example, last year, on July 19th, in the western part of Europe, there was a terrified flooding, which led to a death toll near 200. On July 20th, last, last year, in Henan province of China, there was also a heavy rainfall. And here is the photo for the Zhengzhou East Railway Station. And here is the suburb of Zhengzhou. The average rainfall is larger than 200 millimeters. The three days total rainfall is more than 600 millimeter. Please note the climatological annual mean rainfall here is 640 millimeter. So the extreme rainfall has 
a large impact on the society. The death toll from this flood has reached 300. After seeing all this evidence and pictures, the first question you might ask is, why did all these events happen? The answer is given by IPC the AR6. Recent changes in the climate are widespread, rapid, and intensified and unprecedented in thousands of years. And here is the surface air temperature in the past century. The increasing warming trend is evident. The recent decade is more than one degree warmer than the pre-industrial area. If we extend the time series to the past 2000 years, you can find the human influence has warmed the climate at a rate that is unprecedented in at least the last 2000 years. Climate change are actually occurring throughout the climate system, not only limited to the atmosphere. We also find evidence in the cryosphere, ocean, and the biosphere. So in IPC AR6, it highlighted is unequal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean, and land. Then the second question you might ask is, are the observed changes natural or astrogenic? The answer is, is indisputable that human activities are causing climate change, making extreme climate events, including heat waves, heavy rainfall, and droughts more frequent and severe. There are many also, there are many evidence. And here is the changes of hot extremes. Please note this kind of means the increase of the hot extremes in the observations. You can find over many parts of the world, the hot extremes are increasing in the observations. The dots given here is the confidence in human contribution to the observed changes. If we have, we have three dots, that means the result, the confidence is higher. If we have two dots, that means the confidence is medium. You can find over many parts of the world, the confidence is high. How about the changes of heavy precipitation? We also show the result here. This not green color means uh, the increase. So, for many parts of the world, including East Asia, the heavy precipitation are increasing. If we check the confidence, the confidence is not so high at the hot extremes. Anyway, in observations, the extreme rainfall are increasing. All these results are based on the detection and the attribution studies. The third question you might ask is how will our climate look like in the future? To answer this question, we need climate projections. The answer given by IPCC AR6 is climate change is already affecting every region on Earth in multiple ways. The changes we experience nowadays will increase with further warming. The projection is based on climate models. To do projections, we first need scenarios. And here is the list of the so-called shared social economic pathways. We can have very high emission pathways at this. We can also have high, middle, low, and very low emission pathways. And here is the changes of different components of greenhouse gases. So we can use all this data to drive climate models and project future changes. What I show here is changes in global surface temperature in the end of the century relative to the pre-industrial era. You can find we can either have a world still less than 1.5 degree warming. We can also have a projection of nearly 2 degree warming. If we nearly do nothing in controlled emission in the end of the century, the
the global surface air temperature will be nearly five degrees warmer than pre-industry era. And here is the projected changes or extremes. First is the once in 10 year hot temperature extremes. If we live in the world under 1.5 degree warming, it can find the frequency will increase more than four times. The intensity will increase nearly two degrees. Under four degrees of global warming, the frequency will change more than nine times. The intensity will increase by about five degrees. And here is the changes of once in 10 year extreme rainfall. Again, under 1.5 degree warming, the intensity will increase by 1.5 times. The intensity will increase about 10%. Under 4 degrees of global warming, both the frequency and the intensity will increase. So, after seeing all these evidence, the last question you might ask is, what is the implication of the information? We hope to highlight that we need to limit global warming from large scale reductions in greenhouse gases emissions. For the future, we can either live in a world under 1.5 degree warming or 2 degree warming or even higher 3 de degree warming. If we do nothing, we will live in a world of more than 4 degree of global warming. So, for the future, we have a choice, and also we need action. We need actions right now. That's all for my talk. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Dai Zhong Liu. I'm a director of a Sustainable Cities Program for World Resource Institute. Today, I want to share our works about China road transportation decarbonization strategies toward the carbon neutrality. I'm from the World Resource Institute. We are kind of an international think tank based in Washington, DC, and we have 11 country offices. I'm from WRI China. Uh, the first of all, uh, we found that transportation decarbonization is very important, not only for China, but also for globally. Uh, like this figure showed to you, in the U.S., the GHG emission in 1990, transportation take account of almost 24 percent of overall. But by the year 2019, the U.S. GHG emissions, the largest sector will be the transportation, which take account of almost 29 percent. So we can find that the transportation is quite difficult to decarbonization compared with other the sectors. And the, the same situation also can be found in the Europe and the UK situations. And in China, the transportation only take 4% uh, GHG emissions uh, in 1994. But today, transportation take account almost 10% of, of all the GHG emissions of China. So transportation will be more important. And when we go through the transportation, we found the road transportation and the freight contribute to the largest share. Uh, the left figure show to you that the road transportation take account almost 84% of overall transportation related GHG emission in China by the 2014. And uh, road transportation CO2 emissions in China, uh, when you go to the details of the tools, you can find the private cars will be the number one. Uh, and the heavy duty tracks will be number two and the light duty tracks will be number three. So these three is the largest uh, shares of the, the, the transportation tours. So which means both the passenger cars and the logistic, the freight will be very crucial to the road transportation. So China has already saved the climate related goals that by the 2030, we need achieving the carbon peaking and by the 2060, we need the carbon neutrality. So if we want to uh, successful to make this commitment happen, we need to reduce the CO2 emissions in, in intensity by the 65%, at least from the 2005 by the 2030. And also we need to increase the non-fossil fuel in energy consumption to 25% by the 2030. 
So this means the transportation need to be more ambitious on the decarbonization ways to help China to achieving these uh, climate goals. And on the uh, IES, the key milestones on the pathway to the net zero emission by 2050, we can find the IEA also uh, suggest all the country to achieving that 60% of global car sales should be the electric by the 2030. And the no new ICE heavy trucks can be shared by the 2045. So they also thinking the electrification for the cars will be the, the milestone for the nine zero goals. So based on this background, the WI China, we do uh, research about the China's road transportation sector, uh, how to decarbonization and uh, which kind of scenario we can follow. So under this report, we design about the four different scenarios compared with the BAU, the business at Euro, which is a baseline scenario. So the four design scenario, scenarios include the state policy scenarios, structural change scenarios, deep electrification scenarios, and the last one is a deep decarbonization scenarios. Uh, that's a deep uh, uh, decarbonization is combined the deep electrification and the structural change together. So we can find uh, under the deep electrification and the deep decarbonization, we can achieving almost the night zero by the 2060 from the road transportation sectors. And under the structure chain, we can achieve in early peaking for the road transportation by the 2026, with a lower the, the CO2 emissions uh, amount. So this is a really uh, very encouraging us to make a big addition. And a combination of the decarbonization measures are very important as well. So under this scenario, so we're thinking the zero emission vehicle promotion will be the most important can, can, can share almost 48% of the uh, CO2 emissions reduction compared with the BAU scenarios. And the structure change will be another very important one. They can uh, 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 compare with the BAU scenario, they can reduce almost 23% of uh, CO2 emissions. And the vehicle fuel efficiency improvement is another one play uh, almost 17% of the CO2 emissions reduction. So let's see the passenger cars, the electrification. Uh, you can find China is always the largest market for global EV sales. And this year, the first half of the 2022, China also achieved very good performance on the sales of the new EV. In China, the, 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 the new petrol, uh, the NUV means uh, the new energy vehicles. The battery vehicles is kind of the NUV. So the NUV is achieving almost uh, very good performance. And 57% uh, of the EVs were sold in mainland of China. And in our India's colleagues, the research, we, we can find uh, China also have very good positions along the global EV battery supply chain. For example, like material processing, the cell, the components, the battery, the EV cells. So China also play a very important roles. And uh, BEV sales share comparison with other uh, big stakeholders, including uh, Europe, and the US, China also uh, are very important for the global market. But now we, we don't think the, the passenger car will be very difficult for China. Now, when we're talking about the road transportation, we think freight is a very crucial, but the current policy and the technology are not insufficient. So this is why we need to put more uh, efforts on the freight part. Uh, so this is mainly three parts we can do. The first one is the promotion of the zero emission tracks. The second one is we want to do more model shift about the freight. The last one, we need to improve the operation efficiencies to achieving the freight sectors to reduce the CO2 emissions. So this means we need to combine the technologies, the infrastructures, and also standards and open data together. First one, if we want to unlock the potential of a freight, we need promoting the alternative vehicle technologies. So 
how we do the first thing is to make the tracks more clean energy tracks. That means include the, the zero emission battery tracks, also natural uh, gas tracks, but natural still uh, the, the, the fossil fuel. Huh? And then we move to the fuel efficiency tracks. That means the hybrid tracks and the fuel efficient tracks. And by the long term, we need to uh, achieve the zero emission tracks. That means the battery, the hydrogen fuel together to promote the car, the tracks. So this is the way how we can achieving and promoting the alternative uh, vehicle technologies. And the second one we need to do to unlock the potential of the freight is facilitating the freight model shift from the roadway to the railway. So in lots of figures we can find is compare the road, the rail, and the domestic water transport uh, among the China, the North America, Canada, US, European country, and the India. So we can find both the road and domestic water, China have a good performance, but in the real part, China is really very low. So this is why we also need to improve the, uh, the free transportation in China. So that's the, the mainly three things we have to do is promote the intermode, the real services, and we need to uh, seek a very, uh, competitive the cost the price for the real and also improve the real services qualities so this these three things can move more uh, the roadways of freight to the real so which can also saving the co2 emissions and the last one uh, we're thinking we can unlock the potential of the freight it is improve the operation efficiencies so here also compared to china europe and the united states on the operating uh, oper uh, operational efficiency of the track industry. So you can find that, for example, like the empty running, the China have a 40% of the trips is empty compared with Europe only 20% and the United States only 20%. So that means we still have a lot of uh, uh, space can to improve the, the, the efficiencies for China's track. So the main measures should be to regu uh, regulate the unhealthy the computations, for example, the vehicle, the, the overloading and the mislabeling. And uh, we also need to encourage the internet freight platforms and the non-tracks operating carriers. And the last one, we need to promote the job and the hook uh, operations and the blockchains. So use this way, we try to improve the, uh, the operation efficiencies of track industry which can also achieving uh, a, a CO2 emissions reductions. So uh, this research also analyzes the cost. So we can find the, the marginal the abatement cost curve as of the 2025 uh, freight the electrification is still very expensive, but we have uh, the low cost the, 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 the options, for example, the freight and the passenger structure change it's a very cheap and the same money. Uh, so uh, right side give you the overall combine everything together, the different scenarios, the investment needed to achieving that uh, 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 climate goals. So we can find the deep electrification will be very high cost, but the, the model ship very, very cheap. So we still have a good option for the low cost solutions. So that's it. It's about quickly to introduce our report to you. And if you have interest to learn more, welcome to scan this uh, QR code to download this uh, report and uh, contact me. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Xinhua Li from Tongji University of China. Uh, thank you for coming here. Uh, the topic I will present today is key issues and strategies for achieving carbon neutrality of transportation sector in China. China owns the longest expressway network, the longest high-speed rail network, and the most major parts in the world. China's considerable economic development potential and 
accelerating pace of urbanization will further boost demand for passenger and freight transportation as well. This figure shows estimated on the on road passenger and freight activities, as well as real freight activity growth in 2030 and 2050 compared to 2020 levels. Each of these transport subsectors is expected to experience considerable growth in the next 30 years. You may know, on the other hand, if we look at individuals' energy consumption by activity in lifetime, more than 25% of energy consumption in our lifetime is used to meet people's transportation demand. And transportation is also responsible for significant proportion of greenhouse gas emissions and air pollution that has negative impacts on the global climate and public health. China's CO2 emissions from transportation sector has grown rapidly in the past 20 years. As mentioned in the previous slide, 81% of transportation energy consumption is driven by petroleum. Transportation is currently responsible for almost 14% of greenhouse gas emissions in China, of which over 70% is contributed by road transport. And also from European and US experience, it is not hard to predict that the greenhouse gas emissions from China's transportation sector will likely to continue to increase with the rapid growth of demand if no further mitigation actions were taken. Carbon peak and carbon neutrality goal brings significant pressure to the Chinese transportation sector. Here, based on our research, we propose several strategies to achieve carbon peak and carbon neutrality as the following. The first strategy is optimizing transport structure and efficiency. This include the application of smart and intelligent transportation management control strategy to reduce greenhouse gas emissions through efficiency improvement, like signal control or autonomy. And it also includes optimization of transportation service structure, like cooperation of road freight railways and air mode, multiple size, the transit service and the demand oriented management system. Let's move to the second strategy, promoting vehicle fleet electrification. The keyword here is electrification. Plug-in electric vehicles including battery electric vehicles and plug-in hybrid electric vehicles show great promise for reducing unreal emissions, achieving greater energy security and reducing health impacts. To stimulate vehicle fleet electrification, battery and transmission technology innovation, as well as infrastructure support are expected to release users' mileage anxiety. And also the promotion policy from national or local government may still be necessary in some regions where alternative fuel vehicles may not be that convenient. So why the uh, electric vehicle is really a low carbon travel mode really depends on how the electricity generation mixes in the power system. Like whether it is using coal or natural gas as resources 
efficiency of electricity generation and distribution, which change over time and vary by region. No matter whether greenhouse gas emissions are emitted, we believe they have the equivalent impact on our planet. Look at transportation. We are most familiar with the tailpipe exhaust emissions from vehicles. But there are a lot of other activities that support the functioning of transportation, including the activities of fuel production and supply, vehicle production, maintenance, even the, the operation of infrastructure that support the use of vehicles. We call it, we are familiar with the analysis of transportation systems on a life cycle basis. Considering this, it is critical to transform our transportation energy system to be renewable energy driven. We really need to transform the energy support system into renewable modes to cut off carbon emissions. This includes solar power, wind, and geothermal that generate electricity and produce hydrogen. Another renewable energy that is worth investigation is biofuels, including ethanol for gasoline or biodiesel. This especially shows great promise to highway duty vehicle, which are now still mainly diesel driven. The last strategy is related to behavior. We really need to come up with strategies that can encourage travelers for greener transportation mode, a serious of cheap, of deep research are needed to explore human behavior and their choice preferences when doing travel mode choices. And we think policy in multiple ways like incentives or carbon trade need to be explored to encourage people's mode shift from high emission to lower one to take effective action in personal level, it is critical to understand human's behavior, to build a system that can objectively quantify people's carbon footprint in trip chain level, and to build a comprehensive trading platform for emissions inclusive reduction. And we all know there are definitely a lot of other questions, issues need to be further explored in the future in this regard. Uh, time limited, I have to stop my sharing here and thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I'm Ye Chen from Beijing Normal University, China. And uh, today I would like to give uh, a talk uh, in the title of uh, a midterm review of disaster risk reduction, climate change adaptation, and sustainable development goal from a perspective of integrated risk of governance in the context of Anthropocene era. As everyone knows, that 2015 is a peak, uh, peak year for the global environment activities for the past uh, 60 more years. And uh, in the beginning of the 19, uh, 2015, and we have a uh, Sendai uh, conference from the UN organized this uh, disaster risk reduction conference and the past uh, Sendai framework. And in uh, July, uh, UN all the members passed another uh, agreement on the global sustainable goal. And in the end of uh, 
2015, we uh, finally reached the Paris Agreement, and all this symbolize the peak of this global environment activity. And uh, I believe for all these uh, three community, one consensus is uh, the uh, integrated disaster risk reduction, climate change adaptation, and the sustained development. The three things must be integrated to consider together if we would really want to reach the goal for these uh, uh, three activities. So after seven years now, I think that the one of uh, three questions I think we must uh, address. The first one, of course, is the what has been achieved. And the second, what needs to be emphasized? And uh, the last one, I think it's uh, how can science is help? And I would like to use this uh, school report card to uh, talk about what have been achieved. I think in the past seven years for this global environment activities, we do have uh, one A, one C, and unfortunately, I call it one F, either failure or the future. So the one A is the one, it's uh, actually it's the, it's the Anthropocene uh, the, uh, finding. And uh, this one is actually is by the scientific community based on the past uh, more than six years uh, research result. And uh, the scientific world find uh, abundance of scientific evidence that Earth now enter a new geological era. It's so-called Anthropocene. And uh, in this era, what we can see is that first, we see the great acceleration, not just uh, in the social economic uh, world, but also in the Earth's planet. And uh, the whole planet actually already passed its, uh, in some area, passed its boundary, comfortable boundary, and now enters uh, uh, so called uh, uh, some kind of tipping point uh, area. And uh, so this one is the, I think it's a big finding for the scientific uh, world, but also for the policy makers. And the second, it's one C. It's one C, it's not satisfaction, it's on the climate change issues. And the uh, UN uh, secretary already uh, uh, declare. Now we enter so-called climate emergency. And uh, this is the mentioned many times in the COP, past of COP meet conference. And I think this haven't been changed yet. I think this COP also uh, climate emergency may be more emphasized. And the last one is the one F. I think it's what we call it's uh, we feel a lot of people feel disappointed and we're failure uh, on the earth and also on the people. But I do think this also maybe bring us the future. So either the failure or the future is depending on us. So to do this and what need to be emphasized, I think that's, that's the most important questions uh, to not just scientists, also for the policy maker and also for the general public. I think three things this we need to be emphasized. One is the complexity now we, uh, in our world and the interaction between the, the earth. And the second is so-called interconnectivity due to this uh, technology advance and also with all these uh, people's uh, face-to-face uh, -face dialogue and the talk. And uh, that's all pushing the things interconnecting, uh, interconnected ch changes greatly. And uh, what we see here is a lot of irreversible, irreversible process 
both in the on the earth also in the in the world and this gave a, a new challenge we call systemic risks and this is give a big big challenge and how the question is so what how can science can help i think in my opinion i do believe systemic thinking is a must because the things is so complicated it's a systemic risk we need a systemic thinking and uh, this is actually from uh, uh, almost 50 years ago and uh, we have this uh, nasa first in the science community we launched this uh, uh, gave this uh, notion it's called earth system science and with that we need to conduct you know, develop an analytical uh, framework it's so-called ISEET. We developed these things, and which includes five subsystems: is uh, uh, including institution system, uh, ecological system, economic system, technology system, and the social system. And uh, this is also we need to have this uh, new uh, concept or the new model. It's called consilience model. This developed uh, uh, by Beijing Normal University Professor Sir Patrick's team. And this maybe can help us to better understand what will help us to meet the challenge, meet the systemic uh, uh, risks. And to uh, so that's, I do think, uh, when we to really meet the challenge for the future, I think in the next. Uh, uh, seven years, uh, the whole community, the three community, disaster risk reduction, climate change adaptation, and uh, uh, SDGs community, we need to work together. And uh, with the scientist help, maybe we can reach the goal we set uh, in the uh, seven years ago. So I do would like emphasize this is my last message but the, i think also is the biggest challenge is we right now we really short so-called the knowledge broker uh, that's those the people who trained in multidisciplinary and capable to communicate among various stakeholder you know between the public with the public with the policy maker and the business uh, decision maker and so on and so I do hope our education system can be changed and uh, modified or changed to meet this whole challenge. Thank you very much. That's all my presentation. Good day, everyone. I am Chen Minghe from Zhejiang Carbon Neutral Innovation Institute at Zhejiang University of Technology. Today, I'll share with you one of our recent research, which is about the energy transition and the carbon neutral target and the contributions to the sustainable development goals in China. The background of this uh, research is that China has strategies for climate change mitigation. We have submitted our NDC after the Paris Agreement in 2015 and uh, updated it uh, in 2020, which includes uh, the aim to have uh, CO2 emissions peak before 2030 and achieve carbon neutrality before 2060. At the same time, China has launched the policy development processes to support the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs. We have the National Plan on Implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development in year 2016. So the relationship between the mitigation measures under the specific climate targets and the SDGs are important. And the, the quantitative analysis are urgently required. So this research aimed to do the quantitative analysis of 
the impact of GHG emissions reduction on SDG targets. We do the scenario analysis in this research. Three scenarios are set. The first one is the baseline scenario. In this scenario, include the existing climate and energy policies and targets. We assumed that the G GDP in China will still grow rapidly and uh, all the available low carbon technologies in building and uh, transport sectors develop uh, will be very fast. However, the high consumption pattern and the treatment after pollution way will be kept. The other two scenarios are two degrees and 1.5 degree scenarios, which are consistently with the um, global mitigation to achieve two degree target and the 1.5 degree target set in the Paris Agreement. Both in under both scenarios, the low carbon development with uh, consideration of uh, energy conservation, renewable energy development, and the potential of nuclear power are taken. Furthermore, uh, the rapid development of CCS applied in both power generation and industry sectors are included under the 1.5 degree scenario. We get the results for these three scenarios about the energy and the CO2 emissions. For energy, the primary energy demand would keep increasing in the coming decades in China, both in baseline and mitigation scenarios. But the structure will be very different. The first electrification and the development of non-fossil fuel energy are the main measures for climate change mitigation. We can see this uh, from figure one and figure two. For the CO2 emissions, um, we see that in under baseline scenario, the CO2 emissions peak will be before 2030. And uh, under the mitigation scenarios, this uh, peak would be advanced to between 2020 and 2035. And the CO2 emissions are projected to achieve near zero emission under the 1.5 degree scenario around 2050. That is because uh, the rapid development of CCS technologies. We then quantified uh, some SDGs under these scenarios. We find that uh, uh, the indicators of uh, clean and modern energy the renewable energy proportion, the energy efficiency, the CO2 emission intensity, and the efficiency of material utilization. The um, infrastructure construction of uh, transportation capacity, um, the neutral resource is uh, utilization efficiency, and the uh, materials recycled will be move uh, to um, move in sustainable direction under the mitigation scenarios than the baseline scenario. 
these indicators are corresponding to SDG 7, SDG 8, SDG 9, sorry, and SDG 12. And we also uh, calculated the emissions of air pollutants, such as primary PM 2.5, NOx, SO2, and mercury. These uh, air pollutants are closely related to the uh, morbidity and uh, mortality um, caused by air pollutants. All these indicators uh, are uh, moved in sustainable um, direction so that we conclude that the first point, the mitigation measures and the actions not only address climate change, but also promote the social, economic, and environmental aspects of sustainable development. These uh, aspects include that uh, SDG 7 of the um, um, affordable and uh, clean energy, SDG 8, the economic growth, the SDG 9 about the uh, innovation infrastructure, SDG 12 about the um, responsible um, consumption and uh, industry, and also the SDG 13, the climate actions. And uh, uh, we also um, find that uh, has close relationship with the um, um, SDG 3 about uh, the um, human health and well-being. And the second point of finding is uh, that uh, we also did the cost uh, analysis for these scenarios so that uh, we conclude the integrating energy transition, um, climate mitigation, and achieving SDG policies and actions could make achieving these multiple goals more efficiently. We also see from the uh, result of the CO2 emissions uh, um, pathway that uh, there are challenges for China to reach uh, carbon neutrality goal. We found that the carbon neutrality goal in China might already be stronger than the global two degree tar target and uh, maybe more relatively consistent with the 1.5 target, which uh, require more efforts than um, the actions nowadays. The last one is that we we think the linkage analysis among the energy transition, climate mitigation, and the SDGs are still in very first stage um, because we only did 39 indicators related in this research, uh, which are most from the national perspective. So it needs a further discussion about the uh, relationship between uh, climate change mitigation and the SDGs. These are all of my presentation today. Thank you very much. Dear colleagues, this is Yong He speaking from Chinese Academy of Agriculture Sciences. My speaking is response and adaptation of agroecosystem to climate change. My content covers the two following topics, the response of soil water and nitrogen fluxes to climate change and its corresponding adaptation solutions. 
This is a diagram of uh, agroecosystem or agriculture system. Uh, this system is not only important for the food security, but also very important for, for other SDGs. During the half past century, the agronomist and the scientist has put a lot of effort to increase the crop yield and also increase the water and the nitrogen or fertilizer use efficiency. However, most of the research is based on the hypothesis that the climate is stable. However, if the climate changes, everything will be different for this system. So far, the impact of climate change on the soil, water, and nitrogen fluxes in this system is not very clear. This report published several years in Nature shows that there will be a serious environment problem if we do not take any actions for the uh, agriculture system. And also, another study shows that if we do not take any adaptation actions, the impact of climate change for uh, agriculture is not the crop yield, but also the environment problem. So to check out how to how the response of soil, water, and nitrogen fluxes to response to the climate change and its solution, I'm going to show two case studies in my following slides. The first case study is, is a winter wheat and a summer maize rotation system, which means there's two crops, the so wheat and maize. This case study is located in a semi-humid and warm temperate climate condition. So location is in North China, in Shandong province. There's some study shows that there's a big loss of nitrogen due to the nitrogen leaching. And also the climate change has big impact for the uh, yield. So before we check out how climate change uh, impact this system, let's have a quick look of how the climate changes. This is the temperature and uh, rainfall pattern of uh, for the wheat and maize seasons. And we can find that the temperature increased dramatically for both crop growing seasons. And also more interesting simply is uh, the change of rainfall patterns. And there's uh, some increase for the uh, rainfall. And more interestingly is uh, the pattern, there's, uh, for example, for the May season, there's less small rainfall events, and there's less heavy rainfall events. This is good for agriculture. And uh, after that, we also uh, calibrate and evaluate a crop model. Here we use, uh, which means we use crop model to simulate the impact of climate change. This is uh, uh, the uh, calibration and evaluation of a crop model we used in our study, which called WHCNS. And also we compared the performance with other crop models. Uh, we can find this is uh, uh, for the soil water, and we can find the performance is fairly good and, uh, and also very good for soil nitrate. So the model is very good for, uh, for us to, uh, to simulate the uh, uh, climate change impact. This is a simulation result for this uh, agroecosystem for the two crops. For the, this is water, nitrogen, and growth. And the, the, the arrow in red color is a negative effect, and the blue color is a positive effect. As we can find, there's uh, this, uh, a significant uh, inf influence for the a growth and a green yield. There's a big reduction in green for green yield for uh, for the maize season, and also there's a big green, big increase for water drainage. This is not good, not friendly for water use efficiency, and there's a, a negative effect for the nitrogen leaching for uh, for wheat season. But it's good. There's a positive effect for the maize season. This is a. Uh, uh, not usual for our study because the, uh, the, there's a significant increase for the water drainage, but for mid season, the nitrogen leaching is decreased. 
So we further check out the uh, simple relationship of all uh, simulated uh, output, and we, we find this uh, classic relationship for uh, the temperature with uh, carb growth, and also the uh, the positive or positive relationship between uh, drainage, so water drainage, and the nitrogen leaching, and also a very important relationship between crop at nitrogen uptake with uh, green yield, yield. And this is also uh, similar for uh, maize season. So uh, a, a brief summary for this case study. And we find the climate change alternate the temperature and the rainfall patterns. And as such change has a significant effect for the crop, grow, crop yield and crop growth. And for uh, water and nitrogen fluxes, the water drainage, drainage increased, but the nitrogen leaching decreased. And we find this because there's less nitrogen input due to climate change, and there's less heavy rainfall in fact, in that, and also the shorter life cycle. So there's another question. Could genetic improvement could be an effective adaptation strategy to increase green yield and reduce nitrogen leaching. So uh, we carry this question to our second case study. This study is a single crop, the spring maize. We use this study to answer or to show how to fight a best adaptation solution. This is a very drought uh, climate and the agriculture system here is very vulnerable. And again, we check out how climate changes for this uh, crop rotation system. And we also find uh, the temperature increase is dramatically. And also there's uh, some increase for uh, the rainfall. Here, to answer if the genetic improvement could be useful. We use uh, crop model parameters to create a virtual uh, crop. Here we call this crop is a new new genotype, and we use a new genotype and the the check genotype to uh, to finish our simulation. And this is a simulation output of our model. And again, this is for water, this is for nitrogen and for carb growth and for, for carb yield. And we fight um, the, the, the impact of climate change uh, it, for, the, for the grain yield is negative, but the new genotype could uh, increase the carb yield. But here we also fight uh, the impact of climate change for the uh, evaporation is not very negative. So we conclude that based on this case study, the input agriculture technology could be uh, practiced further to cope with decre decreased crop transp transpiration. And the uh, genetic improvement for water up, uh, for the crop nitrogen update will be very useful. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Hello, time is running out. Uh, what's next? Any any question and the answers? We still have five minutes. No, no questions. It's really a pity we cannot go to Egypt in person. Hope next time. We can meet uh, face to face. So, 
closed. <laughs> there are some audience from the website. They cannot ask question. <laughs> okay, okay. So let's close the the side event today. Thank you, every speakers, and uh, thank you, all the audience. Thank you thank very much. You. Thank 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 you.